Thank you all again for coming again. Um, thanks for coming if it's your first time. My name's George Heritage. I work in the Assessment Services Department for Cambridge Assessment in the Madrid office. And this... Hello, uh, my name is Victoria and I work with George in the Assessment Services Department in the Madrid office. Excellent. So, what are we looking at today, Victoria? We are looking at C1 Advanced. Uh, we will have an overview and then we will try to give some ideas for teaching and learning online. Yeah, we'll have, as Victoria said, an overview of the paper itself. Um, we won't be able to go into lots of detail about all of it because it's an enormous paper and we only have an hour and a half and we're sorry it's such a long webinar but it's a big paper. So we'll uh, be looking over some of the tasks and see one advance to show uh, how they reflect real life skills and think about what is being tested, what students need to know in each part that we have time to look at. Mm -hmm. Victoria? Then we will try to give you some ideas to develop your student skills and hopefully practical ideas to use in class, teaching yeah. online or teaching face to face. Yeah, I think a lot of them, a lot, well, a lot of the material that we would present normally, I think is very easily transferable to online. And mm. unlike with perhaps younger learners or learners at lower levels, I think an advantage of, of, of students at this level is hopefully they can be trusted a lot more to take <clears throat> more responsibility for their own study and their own learning. Um, and there's a huge amount of material online um, that they can use. And again, another mm -hmm. advantage of this level, um, I think, is you can more and more use more authentic material. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, which often is a problem at lower levels. This is part, I know we mentioned this before, but for newcomers, this uh, runs on from the webinar that we did on A2 key and B1 preliminary with, um, with ideas. So it's got a similar structure. We'll be doing B2 maybe this week, probably next week. Um, and then the plan hereafter is to focus in on each paper and will probably involve C2 as well. So we'll look at reading, use of English, C1 and C2, listening, C1 and C2. So we'll be going into much more detail on each skill in those in the future. So we'll have a quick think. Um, some of you will know that back in 2015, I think, mm -hmm. was the last revision for first, advanced and proficiency. And one of the slight changes with um, advanced was it was given a slightly more academic edge uh, to make sure that students who were taking it for academic purposes were well prepared. I and mean, I think it's a very thorough, it's a very thorough exploration of everything that is needed language wise at C1. Uh, but I think post revision, even more than it did before, it reflects some skills that are um, needed in higher education and the workplace. So a quick overview, Victoria, I know we did get through this last time. Mm -hmm. Writing. Yeah, in higher education or at university, students are expected to be able to write essays, develop arguments and structure ideas, and also do research and understand a wide range of sources such as textbooks. Um, this hopefully plays into, as I said before, becoming more autonomous um, as a learner, um, <clears throat> developing independent skills, good time management, and hopefully develop confidence in taking exams. Preparing for C1 is quite scary, sitting C1 even scarier, and hopefully it will help them um, with their confidence in exams <clears throat> thereafter. Hmm. Yes, and in terms of speaking skills, um, students should be able to deliver presentations and take part in discussions, presenting arguments again, and of course, uh, being able to develop conversations and social skills to, to enjoy life outside the classroom. Listening wise, academically, obviously understanding lectures, um, taking notes therein, um, discussions, debates, etc. Um, <clears throat> moving on to the workplace, again, understanding and taking notes at meetings, events, conferences, mm -hmm. um, especially at the moment, teleconferences. Mm -hmm. I think we're all working a little bit more online than we did before. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, reading, writing, correspondence, emails, reports, proposals, which we'll look at later. 
What yeah, being able also being able to to know when to use formal <laughs> and informal language as as appropriate, and as we saw before, being able to have conversations, develop social skills for interaction in this case with customers or colleagues, and also deliver presentations and take part in discussions. Uh, the formal and informal language, I think, especially becomes. Well, even more important at C1, we did um, we did a session on on B1, and we had a lot of teachers saying, "Oh, an article needs to be written in formal language." At B1, even at B2, I mean, it's beginning at B2, but B1 students definitely don't have the <clears throat> flexibility with the language that they have, nor do they really have enough language to convincingly um, write informally and formally. Whereas at C1, this really does start taking a, um, a bigger, playing a bigger role in their writing and their speaking, mm -hmm. I think. Um, okay, so quick overview of the paper. I think this is where we got to last time. Reading mm -hmm. and use of English, um, an hour and a half. And a quick overview, can-do statement. Um, students can understand complex arguments and read quickly enough to follow an academic course. Mm -hmm. And in terms of writing skills, <coughs> students have an hour and 30 minutes to show that they can communicate complex ideas effectively in writing different types of, types of texts. Listening can follow discussion and argument with an only occasional need for clarification. Mm -hmm. And speaking. Yeah, in 15 minutes, students ha uh, should be able to show that um, can have extended conversations and discuss abstract topics with good fluency and range of language. I think one of the big differences now at C1, even from B2, is, um, is complex versus simple. I will look at some writing criteria later. Uh, but we have a lot of, well, an increasing number of younger candidates, 14, 15, who have, I mean, they have the language, but sometimes they're not, they're not building up and communicating complex ideas versus writing about straightforward ideas in, in, in complicated ways. And I think this is one of the big steps up at C1. Hmm. So, writing, Victoria. Very quickly in the chat box. Very quickly, um, what helps our students improve their writing? What helps students improve their writing? We've asked this to thousands of teachers over the last three or four weeks in different webinars. And it's always interesting to see, yes, Jorge, first one everybody says is reading. <laughs> Even more so at this level now, I think there's, a, a, it's going to be very, very difficult for students to be able to write in a variety of um, registers and a variety of text types convincingly if they have not read enough, um, if they're not familiar with those text types and that use of language. Um, what else? Practice, reading, vocabulary, plan, Feedback. excellent, Cal. Mm -hmm. Reviewing. Um, reviewing, lovely. Structures and expressions, yes. Practice Mothers. makes perfect. Mm -hmm. A lot of writing, studying lots of grammar. Yeah, to some to some extent. Planning. Thanks, Lucy. Good to see you again. Critical thinking. Using oh, linkers. Of using linkers. Using linkers well and convincingly, mm -hmm. rather than just sort of throwing them everywhere, which sometimes happens. Maybe a bit more of B two. I think. Well, lovely. Okay, we've got lots of ideas there. Um, our big three areas, Victoria, and we're thinking about writing now from a teaching point of view as well. So mm -hmm. beginning, you know, let's say in two weeks' time, you want your students to produce an essay. Um, mm -hmm. We've got to think about how we're going to lead them into that preparation, yeah, help them awesome. with their planning, mm -hmm. and after um, essential. Reviewing, very important. So preparation, Victoria? Yeah, uh, preparation we think uh, includes motivation. So this can uh, mean using digital resources and uh, making activities more appealing, trying to personalize material. And of course, try to make students participate actively thinking about their own personal situations, but also 
looking at conventions, being able to analyze models of different types of texts that at C1 there, there is a wider range of texts they need to be able to write and also reflect on what the different text types um, are like. Lovely. And scaffolding, which is our job as teachers. And we've spoken about that a lot at the lower levels in our previous webinars. Um, I think it's as, as important at this level, but obviously how we're going to break a task down into stages is going to be quite different, I think. Mm -hmm. um, planning, my favourite. <laughs> um, <laughs> I always used to tell my students, and I apologise if you've heard this before, but in an exam, take 10% of the time available, which is how many minutes? Nine minutes mm -hmm. out of 90 minutes. Yep. Nine, maybe 10 minutes to carefully plan what they are going to write and review at the end. And I think it makes all the difference, especially in an exam situation. If you you know, freak out halfway through, you have a nice clear plan in front of you. Um, it definitely helps. It helps on the content side of things, if we're thinking about writing criteria, definitely. So there's nothing worse than a beautiful piece of writing, but they've missed one of the content points. Mm. They're going to lose marks there instantly. Yeah, it's a shame. And obviously, <laughs> really? organization, making sure it has a nice logical flow to it, a nicely organized piece of writing, can definitely be helped by planning beforehand. Um, <clears throat> apart from content, etc., I think the task requirements and the purpose. Mm -hmm. The purpose is going to affect everything about the piece of writing. Um, this all plays into, well, they all overlap with one another, really. Mm. Uh, but your target, who your target reader is, is going to affect um, the type of language you use. Um, and I think the purpose and target reader, there's quite a bit of overlap there as well. Um, and lastly, Victoria, your favorite. Yeah, uh, <laughs> reviewing. So checking that you have included um, a wide range of appropriate vocabulary and also simple and more complex grammar. Also checking that you are not repeating ideas and um, checking for slips and also making sure that you have, as you as George said before, included all the content points and the task requirements. Lovely. Other ideas or other methods um, that can help students improve their writing? Um, peer assessment and self-assessment. At this level, students should be self-assessing sort of automatically, I think. Um, with the new online situation, I think um, peer assessment um, in some ways could be a lot easier now than in the classroom. Do you agree, Victoria? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's... It there are more opportunities maybe for for that type of, yeah. of assessment yeah and a more <laughs> anonymous approach to peer assessment mm. um <clears throat> obviously teacher feedback we we did a whole webinar just on giving feedback on writing which you can find on our on our youtube channel um, mm -hmm. if you want to look at that in more detail <clears throat> And, and also learning diary, which we know that it can be a bit tricky to, to set up and maintain throughout the year. But if it works, if your students keep a record of the different um, pieces of writing that they have produced throughout the year, also if they take notes of the common mistakes that they used to make, and maybe now they realize that they are making fewer and fewer of them, so um, I think it is a great tool, but uh, it is true that it is a bit tricky. But no, it will... depends. I think mm -hmm. I mean, there, there yeah. are lots of different lots of different um, uh, manifestations of a learning diary. Whether it's mm. you know a vocab book to yeah common errors or things that you used to do and you don't anymore. We'll be looking very briefly at an incredible online um, mm. tool you can use or students can use as a writing learning diary. Uh, later, um, but again, I think a lot of this is is putting putting the responsibility in the students' hands. Like we were saying earlier about becoming much more autonomous learners. And the YouTube channel is Cambridge English TV. You just Google Cambridge English YouTube's webinars; it will be on there. Okay. Right. Motivation, Victoria. Again, one of the trickier. I mean, I think it's probably. I don't, is it harder to motivate? students to read or to write i suppose it depends mm. depends how you set things up yeah um, it depends. 
do you have any exciting ideas for motivation, Victoria? Uh, well, um, I, will, I don't know if it's very um, exciting, but we are going to try and have a look at an idea to motivate our students to start writing or at least start thinking about writing an essay. Which is, go on, Victoria. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we suggest the, the topic of the of the essay, and we give them some uh, visual input to it, which uh, will help them come up with ideas and maybe um, see how the the topic uh, relates to them. Yeah, Sabtash has just said motivation comes from interest. And yes, trying to make things relevant to your students, Lucy as well, connecting to your students, making it interesting and relevant to them is the first step. Um, you as teachers are free to set the writing tasks that you give your students at this level. Um, so try and make it relevant to them. And we've started off using visuals. These are straight out of a speaking exam. I think even more um, than a lower level, well, the higher you get, the more integrated um, skills can become in preparation for mm -hmm. a particular one. So, yep, start off with a discussion, start off speaking, brainstorming, group work. I don't know how many of you are using Zoom, but I've heard that the breakout rooms on Zoom give a great opportunity for <clears throat> lead-in tasks like this. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, Courtney, for that. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's another, another approach. Um, so once we've once we've tried to stimulate some interest and get them motivated in what they're writing about, scaffolding, helping them through the process. And as with the lower levels, I think um, the best approach to scaffolding is to start as teachers start with what is going what what is required, a piece of writing, an essay. Break it down into as many constituent parts as you can and then work on those parts building up towards doing the essay rather than right this week writing essays off you go which i think can sometimes be a little daunting a little hmm. overwhelming don't you think victoria hmm. yeah i agree mm -hmm. um somebody said earlier if we have rubrics or criteria we have quite we have published criteria for um for um marking writing uh, which is available in all of the teacher's handbooks. Uh, we also did a, a, an essay on a, a webinar on writing criteria. Um, and we looked at how all, at, all of the criteria that we use to mark at Cambridge is evident in every task that is written. And this is a C1 essay task, just broken down into constituent parts. Um, so how could you use this in, in class, Victoria? Well, um, taking like a step by step approach and trying to get students to focus on each of the parts at a time. And well, I think that if you have already done the discussion part with the with the pictures, maybe some of the ideas that your students have come up with are already included here. So in this sense, I think it will be easier for them to to justify opinions and to have the vocabulary and the structures ready for the writing part uh yeah definitely um, i'm just going to give you all access now to a handout so i think this activity is on the handout that we're mm. giving it should pop up in the bottom right hand corner you should have access to that now um also i think it's quite encouraging if you break this down and then pull everything together and show them well you've got you've got most of your content ready to go. Um, another another approach, Victoria? Yeah, uh, I think we always uh, suggest uh, a good idea to give, <laughs> is to give students a sample answer like this one. Uh, you can find them in the, in the handbooks for teachers. And um, again, have some questions that um, encourage your students to, to reflect on the ideas mentioned, how they are organized, how they are justified. Um, will help them to to do that more independently in the future. And then uh, you can always uh, complement the activity with like this gap fill um, that you have in your in your handouts, in which students can have some practice uh, filling in the gaps with with the suitable connectors. And as I said before, you know, integrating skills, a little bit of use of English practice here, mm. working on vocab, working on grammar, um, whilst also preparing them um 
for the essay. So using sample answers um, is also a really nice approach. If you look in the teacher's handbook, um, there are various samples with examiner's comments on them. And I think samples are a really nice approach because students see what what candidates at their level tend to produce and how they then will, will be marked. Somebody earlier said, can we give the criteria to the students? Yes, please mm -hmm. make sure they're aware of the criteria and how their yeah. writing is going to be marked. Sample yeah. answers are... Oh, sorry, sorry, George. I'm it sorry. is true that they, sometimes they need to be adapted. So depending on the level, maybe we need to adapt the, the marking criteria yeah, a bit so that they can understand it. C1, C1, I think they should be. No, they should be they fine. They should be fine with C1. Mm -hmm. um, so sample answers. Another, another approach is using model answers. What's the difference between a model and a sample? Um, yeah, a model um, shouldn't have any, any mistakes. So it's mainly used for maybe like reading practice, but a sample answer is, is supposedly uh, produced by a learner. So it has uh, mistakes which are typical uh, for the level. Yeah, exactly. Um, so we're going to have a look at a couple of the task types that come in at C1 in a second. But first, what language functions do learners need to demonstrate at C1? In the chat box, what language functions or what kind of functional language do learners need to demonstrate in C1 writing? Any ideas in the chat box? Everybody's typing at once. <laughs> All of them. <laughs> <laughs> That's a pretty easy answer, Rosie. Well, um, uh, yeah, most of them. <laughs> um, all of them. Uh, requesting, fluency, reasoning, mm -hmm. nice, introduced thinking. Motivation, disagreeing, asking, develop, yeah, developing an argument. We've got a lot of different answers here. Expressing opinions, supporting, supporting their opinion. opinions, definitely, Caitlin. Um, these are the main ones we've come up with for C1. So, yeah, pretty much all of them. <laughs> <laughs> Describing, evaluating, hypothesizing, persuading, expressing, yeah, expressing opinion. opinion, comparing, giving advice, justifying, agent, ad Ooh, and judging priorities. <laughs> and also a lot of these all overlap as well um, mm -hmm. at this level. Um, and they should be should be familiar, very familiar with, in, in addition to an essay, email, letter, proposal, report, and review. Um, and each of these, some of these will need more language functions than the others, uh, but I think there's a place for most of them in in, in all of these task types. We looked at the essay in our Writing at B2 webinar um, a couple of weeks ago. So mm -hmm. we're gonna leave that um, today. And what are we gonna look at, Victoria? We're going to look at proposals and reports. These two come in, um, which one's new at C? One of them comes in at B2, doesn't it? Report for the standard. Uh, B2 first. For standard B2, but not for schools. Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. haven't got spoken about any of these yet, so we're going to have a look at the proposal and the report. Uh, and sometimes it's difficult to know what the differences between mm. these are. are. Um, I've said previously with an article, and definitely with a review, my stronger candidates who have a very good, flexible command of language and write fluently and write very mm, confidently, I would mm -hmm. push them towards writing a review. There's a bit more freedom in a review. For our, for our less strong or less confident candidates, proposals and reports are a nice, a nice way to get through C1 advanced, I think. They're nicely structured and there's a lot of input, uh, which does need to be transformed and reflected therein, but a lot more structure to it, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so here's an example of a proposal and a report. Mm -hmm. And what are we going to do? Oh. I don't know what are we going to do for trials. I was waiting for you. Waiting for <laughs> you to take over. <laughs> well, well, we are going to try and find similarities and differences, right, exactly. between proposals and reports. They do have a lot in common. 
but there mm -hmm. are some key differences. Um, <clears throat> so, Victoria, similarities? Yeah, uh, both can have sections with subtitles. They can both be formal or informal. We just need to have a look at the rub rubric. Be very um, careful with the rubric. Yeah. Because if they should be formal, they should be formal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Uh, no, that's no, okay. And <laughs> they should both have an introductory paragraph giving the purpose or the aim of the text. Lovely. The difference is, Lucy, pointed out one of them. Yes, a report closes the recommendations based on what has been written about and evaluated. Mm -hmm. um, a proposal closes with suggestions, probably with a bit more of a, <clears throat> a bit more of a future situation in mind. I don't know if mm -hmm. that's entirely accurate. No, uh, ish. Am, is that clear, Victoria? Do you agree yeah, I think you? so. Yeah, I think that's uh, for me. It is clear. Yeah. All right. Good. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, there is a lot of overlap between these. But they do have to be aware of the the sort of nuanced differences between them. And the biggest is closing with recommendations, closing with suggestions. Okay. So if we have a look at how do we assess these. And what sort of feedback do we give? Firstly, a nice tool for teachers, Victoria. This is hmm. yours. <laughs> yeah, uh, for uh, to give assessment and also to offer feedback. Um, there are some tools that we can use when teaching online and also when teaching face to face. But um, the first one that you can see it's a, a word document, and you can uh, take two different you can have two different options here the first one is to use the track changes and make the changes and just maybe you can use screencast and explain orally how you uh, why you're making the changes or the reason for suggestions so that it is clearer for the student the other option that you you may want to use is just highlight uh, where the problems are like i've done in the the first like, screenshot and then um, use a code that uh, you should have agreed on with your students beforehand so that they uh, know where what type of problem there is and they can uh, be responsible enough to make the changes and improve their text. Lovely. And the other option is to use um, a shared document like Google Docs. And I think this works really well um, for peer assessment because you can have um, different students working on the, on the same document at the same time and, and maybe also for collaborative writing could work really well. Lovely. Um, Some we were saying earlier, how do we get students to rewrite things or revisit a piece of writing? I think if we're doing everything online, which many of us are at the moment, it makes this much easier. It's it's difficult to get a student who's handwritten a piece of writing uh, to take your marks and then rewrite it again. Whereas using something like Google Docs, um, just Word documents or write and improve, which I think mm -hmm. we're going to look at next, yeah. mm -hmm. um, is a really nice way to um to do this we're not going to go into much detail here because we have in other webinars but write and improve is an incredible online resource um you go to the website sign in um create an account we recommend this because then it keeps track of everything that you've done um and then students can choose between beginner intermediate or advanced workbooks there are now, I think, business tasks as well for any of you teaching business students. Um, and they write their, 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 their piece on the platform, put it in, click a button, and get instant detailed feedback. Um, so they get a CEFR level for the piece of writing, and they get word, phrase, and sentence feedback. It doesn't correct things for them. It guides them to where, towards where the problems are um and and puts puts responsibility in their hands to make the changes make the improvements click again and um and continue and see, improving see how, see yeah. how they improve. mm. and rita um four years ago when it first came out it wasn't great above b2 but this goes all the way up to c2 plus now quite comfortably if you watch um 
Which one did we do in Victoria? The right criteria or getting feedback right? Mm -hmm. uh, we spend about 20 minutes talking through Write and Improve. Um, there are additional features which you used to have to pay for, um, but you can now. If you sign up now, you get a two-month free trial of all of the functionality. Everything that I explained that students can do um, is free. And you as teachers can set up a workbook and send the code to your students. That's all free. It always has been. There's an additional great feature called Class View, where you get details, visibility of every attempt that your students have taken to do one piece of writing, and graphs showing their progress and everything. Please explore it if you haven't already. It's, mm -hmm. um, it's an excellent tool. And yeah, all the way up to C2. So, speaking about assessment and marking, uh, mm -hmm. I think you all have access in your handouts, probably, I'm just going to find out what page it's on. Uh, the assessment criteria is on page seven, and right after that is the, the, first, um, the first assessment activity, which is this one. Yeah, but don't tell them because then they'll look at all the answers. So here's no, an example. No, no, no. They just have to look at the first, okay. <laughs> the first page. <laughs> um, this is an example of a report, very typical report. And as I mean, as we pointed out earlier in the essay, there's quite a lot to read here. There's quite a lot to take on board. So they do need talking through the stages of writing the report, what to look for, the info they need to look for, and how that will influence their final piece of writing. But here is a sample question. And here is an answer. What are we going to look at, Victoria? Mm, I would say either communicative achievement or organization, George, you decide. Hmm. <laughs> communicative achievement. Okay. Let's go for communicative achievement. So communicative achievement at this level at C1. Um, I mean, it all, uh, a lot of people, when they think community of achievement, they just think, oh, register and text type. But once we're getting up to the top of B2 and we're getting a C1, um, it really starts to divide into using the conventions of the task to hold the target reader's attention effectively um, and to communicate ideas. Uh, I think a band three C1 is communicate straightforward and complex ideas effectively. So if we're going up into a band four, which is up at the, the sort of getting a B at, at C1, so up towards the, the upper end of C1, we want them to be communicating complex ideas effectively using the conventions of the task type. Okay, so um, on a scale of zero to five, what would you give this? Based on that assessment criteria, what would you give this for communicative achievement? Oh, everyone's reading it very carefully. Or oh, they've just lost interest. Oh, oh. Esther, five, four, five, five, four, four. Four, 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 five, ooh, very, ooh, six. Nice <laughs> one. He didn't read the criteria. Uh, four, 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 five. Oh, we've got very generous teachers here, which is nice. Five, five, four, five. Right, one thing you have to remember, I didn't explain this, I'm sorry. C1 criteria, which is what you have, been, you have on your handouts, is divided into five bands. A band three is C1. Okay, a band five in C1 is the same as a band three in C2. So all of our criteria works like this. It overlaps uh, because we know that one level is not, you know, an island in itself. So, um, <laughs> how much mm. any shadow of doubt because he scrolled down and said the answers, isn't he? Um, so a three here is a sort of a C at C1. Okay, and yes, a lot of you were right. It is a four. Content is a five. Um, they've uh, they've done everything that has been asked of them in the question quite easily. Um, organization is a four. Well organized, coherent. Language a three. So this is C one language, not high C one, but it's C one language. 
and cumulative achievement. It uses conventions of report writing to communicate the ideas effectively. Good use of title, subheadings, each section focus on a topic. A range of language of evaluation, comparison and suggestion, um, which is used to fulfill the communicative purposes of the task. Um, and the target reader's attention is held both straightforward and complex ideas are expressed appropriately. Okay, so we'll move on to a proposal now. Here is a sample question for a proposal. I think Lucy earlier said should, could more appropriate within a proposal. You write the proposal explaining why the building should be preserved and suggesting what could be done to modernize it and how the building could benefit the local people. So we're instantly slipping into more conditional language, mm -hmm. um, which gives your nice C1 candidates an opportunity to show off. Um, and here is the proposal. We'd like you again to focus on communicative achievement for this, please. Give you 30 seconds. Have a look at this. Bit more variety now. Four, three, two, three, three. Mm. Interesting. Oh, still getting a little bit high. Three, four, three, four. Okay, I would love to spend lots more time on this, but we've got a lot to get through. So again, content five. They answer the question quite successfully. Organization is organizing coherence, but in the middle of C1, um, within each paragraph, variety of cohesive devices, more complex patterns used for emphasizing important points. The language isn't quite at C1 um, here. Uh, range of vocab used appropriately, range of simple and complex grammatical forms. Uh, but there are some errors. Um, so it's under, under C1, we would say here. Community of achievement, interestingly, what's the big difference here, Victoria? Here, uh, that the, the mark wasn't very good, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Victoria has been concentrating. Uh, I think the most interesting thing here is this middle bit. It's what we were talking about before. Um, <clears throat> The conventions are evident, language of suggestion and persuasion is used at the top, the bottom, register and tone appropriate, use of headings suitable. But what is the problem? This is a big proposal report difference. The focus of this proposal tends to be on the past rather than on the future. And so there's a more there should be more emphasis on how the building could make a huge difference to the town if it were preserved and modernized. So that I think exemplifies quite nicely what we were trying to say earlier about the difference between a proposal and a report. They've fallen down here on community of achievement because it's written more like a report than a proposal. Right, 40 minutes on writing. <laughs> um, reading and use of English, Victoria. Yes, we are going to look at some, uh, some ways to develop um, reading and use of English. This is your section now. I'll see you in 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Victoria? Yeah, um, as with all the different, all the skills, really prediction is, is key. Um, we can help our students predict by looking at title, um, also uh, pictures, also knowing the text types, if they are familiar with the different text types and their structure, it will be easier for them also to predict uh, the type of information that they are going to, to find or where to find it. Yep. And that will help them also when deciding what type of, what sub skill they need to use. Because yep. this is key, right, at this, at this level now, yep, being able to, to decide if they need to scheme, scan, 
Yeah. Um, so looking, it's really... so the first sort of 10 seconds looking at a text or less, um, they should have a sort of a good idea of the text type, an inherent understanding of the structure. Um, and so they will then be able to decide, do I need to skim this, get a general idea? Do I need to read for detail? Obviously, it will depend on the task in the um, in the exam. Mm -hmm. uh, but these sub skills of reading become um, increasingly important at this level. Expeditious mm -hmm. reading, knowing knowing what type of reading to employ for each um, each part of the exam is very important because the tasks that are designed to be skimmed um, are too long. They're too long for students to read the whole text, read the questions, read the whole text again, in case they mm -hmm. really need to have these skills well honed, I think. Mm -hmm. um, moving on to, well, half and half, actually. Um, parts one and two in the reading and use of English um, mm -hmm. are both closes. What is the difference, Victoria? Part one is a multiple choice close. So there are four options, I think. So three structures and part two is an open close. So students need to come up with a, with a word that's not provided. Exactly. And the kind of languages that are tested in these? Mm -hmm. Uh, part one, it has a more lexical focus, whereas at, in part two, the emphasis is more on, on grammar. You jumped the gun a little bit there, Victoria. I was going to talk them through what was on screen. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, yes. <you> <laughs> All of these, and I mean, as we said before, you know, what, what, what were we asking? What were we asking? Somebody said everything. Oh, language functions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What aspects of language are going to be tested in part one and two? Once you're advanced, yeah, basically all of them. Um, <laughs> but knowing which to expect in which part, I think is important. So yeah, collocations, conjunctions, idioms, auxiliaries, phrasal verbs, blah, blah, blah. Um, one of the big problems of the differences though, as Victoria said, is part one is much more lexical. Uh, because of this, part one is actually tested as reading. Um, the, the revision in 2015, 2016, reading and use of English became one paper. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, it was two separate papers. But the part one, the multiple choice close, is actually tested as reading because of this much more lexical focus, which, I mean, uh, a lot of the open close, which is straight, hardcore grammar, can be learned studying grammar maybe <laughs> whereas the more lexical stuff the only way you can really build that um that big and developed um an understanding and knowledge of vocabulary is by reading um so that's why the part one is um is marked as reading what do you prefer what did you prefer victoria part one or part two have you ever done advanced? No, you just did proficiency. No, I just did proficiency. I was proficiency. But I, really um, difficult. It was difficult, yeah. And <laughs> long. I remember that. Uh, but yeah, I you know that I always um prefer use of English. Oh uh, yeah, well I like use of English as well. Um so yeah, the parts one and two make sure students are aware of what they are being tested on and how to best prepare for those. Um, moving on to part three, we'll look at the word transformation or the sentence transformation. We'll look at that in our B2 because it's introduced at B2, as yeah. is this, but I think word formation is even more horrible at C1. Mm -hmm. um, not only do your students need a, a very good appreciation and understanding of vocabulary, um, What's really important with this part, Victoria? And they know that they can decide um, what part of speech they they need to they need to fill in the gap, and also um, very important that they read the text before they start filling in the gaps, and that they um, read it afterwards to check that it makes sense. Exactly, um, because there will always be something like Part C. There'll always be an unsupervised. Mm -hmm. So without thinking about it, they'll have a look. They'll be right. That needs to be past participle because it's passive, 
and then they don't actually read it and it doesn't make sense. So please be, uh, please drill that into all of your students. Make sure you check your answer afterwards. Make sure it works. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and how, what is a great way to approach this kind of text, this kind of activity, Victoria? Yeah, trying to make your students aware of what really knowing a word uh, means. Because sometimes we, we think that we know a word, but there are a lot of nuances in, in this um, these, uh, statement of saying, I know a word. Yeah, exactly. So, putting mm -hmm. up a word on the board sometimes, and I remember I used to do this, I put a word on the board in the context that we'd learnt it, and then leave it. I learned not too quickly, but you know what I mean. You, you see a word in one context, you put it on the board, um, everybody writes it down, and you haven't really gone deep into what the implications and everything surrounding yeah. that word really are. <clears throat> so record or record, which one is it, Victoria? You made this. It just depends. Yeah, no. but I don't need any context to yours. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So what do we need to think about when learning a word? Here yeah. are some ideas, <laughs> Victoria. Yeah, we need to know if we know all its its forms, which is very important for, for part three, of course, but also how to uh, build related words, if there are grammar restrictions, how is it used, when it is it appropriate, also how does it relate to other words, if we know how to spell it and if we can pronounce it. Well, Correct. exactly. This one could be record or record. Mm -hmm. And if we go for the noun that comes out of it, recorder, that would might trip up a few people because mm. it's just an it's just, a, it's just an instrument that we were all made to play at school. Um, so, yeah, getting your students used to this, and when they discover a word, I think trying to build that curiosity in them for words, mm. which lots of us have. I think lots of English teachers especially have. Family trees, yes, because you know vocab families mm. definitely. Um, I think there this should be a sort of second nature for students at this level. Um, a really nice resource for you as teachers and for and for candidates, Victoria, mm -hmm. is? Is the English vocabulary profile. Uh, it is really useful because it shows uh, um, which uh, level different expressions or phrases are used. Um, and we need to take into account that this is based uh, on the um, on learners' production. So yeah. um, it is true that they can understand it maybe at a lower level, but they are able to produce it maybe at higher levels. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So it's a huge corp corpus pro project been running between us and Cambridge University Press for about 20 years, based on language from, from learners. Um, and it's a great resource of vocabulary. If you go into um, into a word, as you can see here, um, <clears throat> it will give you the word family, the verbs, uh, pronunciation, <clears throat> and the level that it is commonly, those various, well, the varieties of that word are commonly used at. Mm -hmm. Also available for grammar. Thank you, David pointing that out. It's good to see David's listening. Um, <laughs> other nice ways to practice for this, Victoria? Yeah, try to have some some games, um, give your students a suffix, you can show them a card or like if you have a breakout room, you can tell them and then uh, they have to write words that uh, have this suffix. But uh, when they are um, playing with their with their classmates they can they will have to write the part of the word that comes before the sub the suffix mm -hmm. so the other students can guess what the suffix is and i think it's nice. a nice way to to start a lesson and maybe to finish a lesson um or in the middle of a lesson what about in the middle of a webinar i think we've got time to play this now probably not we've got too much to get through <laughs> no, no, no. Um, <laughs> So that was thinking about vocab and grammar. Um, vocab especially, I think. A lot of candidates um, who have you know, got up to B2 um, and then they're like, okay, I'm going to do C1 in a year, um, are quite taken aback by the step up. I think every, every step up the CEFR ladder is, is an exponential step. Mm. you agree, Victoria? 
Mm, I do. Mm -hmm. um, totally. But I think one of the biggest jumps from, from B2 to C1, personally, I think is vocab. Um, grammatically, they're, they're not expected to know in terms of, you know, um, oh, how can I explain this? <laughs> <laughs> you carry on, Victoria. I'm, I'm, no, 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 George, there. you started. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I have now, haven't I? Um, obviously, they do need to know and be familiar with uh, more grammar, but I think one of the biggest jumps is 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 in vocab, in collocation, mm. um, and that part one is 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 a uh, is a very nice example of that. Um, beyond vocab and grammar, as we mentioned earlier, reading, Victoria, what reading skills do learners need at C one? Well, if we continue with what we have been mentioning before, all of them, right? Well, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they need to scheme uh, and to scheme read a text to decide if it's interesting or relevant. They also need to understand the text in detail. And uh, they also need to be able to quickly locate information in a longer text and, of course, follow the instructions. So I think that the key here is um, deciding when they need to use each of their sub skills. Yeah, um, instinctively. Mm -hmm. um, practice for this in class, Victoria? Yeah, uh, I think uh, we have mentioned this. So motivation, making sure that uh, you you ask your students to collaborate. Maybe you they can supply texts that they find useful on different topics from different sources in different registers as well. Make sure you include some pre-reading discussion questions to get them interested. And as you said, skills integration is, is a very nice is a very nice way to to um, supplement or to to support different skills. And to make it more more natural, I think yeah. really. Mm -hmm. We very rarely only use one language skill. Mm. Um, Text exploitation. Yeah. Um, again, I think uh, speaking about you know integrated skills, um, exploiting everything that you use, whether it be in a reading or um, preparation for a writing or students' writing. Hmm. Um, yes. And also George scaffolding. We we have talked about this already, but uh, trying to use pre-reading activities to to break the, the task into different stages. Also making sure that you give your, your students opportunity for speed reading and also uh, you give them you <coughs> give them opportunities to come across longer and more complex texts. They also need preparation for that. Definitely. Um, a really nice um, activity that can be easily um, done on Padlet Mm. Is this Victoria? Talk us through it. Yeah, and uh, you can find three new stories, for example, cut the three texts up into paragraph chunks, then place each story on a different table or on Padlet, and get students to work in groups on, or pairs, and assign a news desk or a Padlet and a story. So students will have to put the story back together in the correct order and maybe then you can integrate skills and get them to prepare a summary and they can read maybe uh, their story to feed back to the class. Um, this is a really nice idea. A way you could take it further um, would be to find three different versions of the same story. So the same story from three quite different sources um, so you could take it from a from a tabloid from a broadsheet um, chop them all up and the, the first stage is making sure they know which ones go together I'll uh, get them really I mean this could be much this could be more appropriate for C2 we get them really looking at the language that's being used the register that's being used um, you could make a week out of this quite easily I think don't yeah. you, Victoria? Easily. Yeah, nice. I used to do that. I used to do a really nice journalism week talking B2 plus better with stronger, stronger kinds, talking them through different aspects of um, British journalism, um, at least, um, and getting them familiar with different different approaches to writing, different styles of writing, different, format, uh, different formats 
um, mm. and registers. And the, using something like Padlet, it's a really nice way to uh, to do this. I think it could be done quite easily on mm. um, online. Mm -hmm. um, another great resource. This is Lucy mentioned earlier on the right hand side about Speak and Improve, which is very much in development. This is also very much in development, um, but please use it. Um, it's called Read and Improve. David might have the link somewhere. I sent it. Yeah, we had it ready for the last session. Um, if not, I'll uh, I'll send it towards the end of uh, end of this session. What is Read and Improve, Victoria? Well, it is a platform, um, and you can uh, you you have to select the CFR level in which you are interested, and then you have a list uh, of um, articles or texts <coughs> that um, you can you can choose. And uh, you can work on it, as we're going to see on the next slide. This is, for example, one of the texts. And these, are, these, these are genuine texts, OK? Mm -hmm. These are all taken from the internet. Yep, carry on. Sorry for interrupting you, Victoria. No, 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 no worries. Uh, and what you, you can do is you, you can hover over the um, different words, and you can see, um, yeah. Here you can see um, the meaning, how it is used, also how it is used in combination with other with other words. Yeah, the so, word cloud, the word cloud at the bottom mm -hmm. um, is words which often appear in sentences with this word market. Again, this is this is artificial intelligence, so it's learning, it's getting better. But this is a really nice, different approach to a more interactive approach to something um, whilst well, looking at vocabulary compared mm -hmm. to the English vocab profile we looked at earlier. Mm -hmm. um, and beyond this, at the moment, I think the only activity is Yeah, it's writing a summary. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah, exactly. But you can write that summary and it will it will grade you on your understanding of the text. Victoria, I'm just going to get a glass of water. So it's all in your hands, OK? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay. So, well, uh, that's all for read and improve. Um, as George said, is it's beta now, so um, you can use it. But well, take into account that that it is it is learning. Okay, so it's not it's not perfect. And now we're going to move on to listening skills. Okay, and my first question uh, for you is what makes listening in another language difficult? Ooh. Any ideas in the chat box, please? What makes listening in another language difficult? Well done, Victoria. Did they behave in my absence? <laughs> they did, yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> they are excellent, of course. Yes, Pradeep, the site is completely free. Uh, you do have to log in, but you can use the same login as you do for Write and Improve, which is nice. Actually, it, will, it will link through to that quite nicely. That's it. That actually, it suggests a CFR level based on the on the tasks that you've been doing in writing. Based on the writing. So uh, mm -hmm. hopefully at some point in the future, they will all come together. Speak and improve, write and improve, read and improve. Yeah, oh, George, we have a lot of answers. We have a lot of answers. Um, this is what we came up with, Victoria. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, concentration, attention, of of course, uh, <coughs> level of interest, the processing time needed, which depends on the complexity of the of the content. Also, um, how much background knowledge we have about the the topic. Although this shouldn't be relevant in our tasks because we try to create them so that background knowledge isn't relevant yeah. and also being able to understand context the amount of visual support and obviously being able to identify the speaker's purpose can be tricky sometimes yeah um, a lot of you mentioned it before much more phonological and pronunciation features so pronunciation being different from the listeners expectations accent obviously the speed of speech, um, interpreting the intonation. And once we get up to C1, intonation becomes even more important, um, <clears throat> along with stress. The use of fillers can confuse sometimes. They shouldn't too much up at this level, I don't think. Um, and yeah, self-correction and repetition 
by the speaker. Um, what was I going to say, Victoria? No say? idea, George. Something popped up in the in the chat box. The British uh, Open was this year. Sorry, pardon. Or no, the certificate. I don't know. I thought no, someone asked no, me how no, it was something else completely different. Um, <laughs> okay. All of our listening exams are <clears throat> recorded with native accents, but yet a variety of those. So make sure your students are familiar with. Um, with various accents from the US, from Canada, Ireland, England, Wales, Scotland, where else? Victoria, Australia, New Zealand, mm -hmm. maybe South Africa, so that they're not taken aback in the exam when they suddenly hear, um, when they hear an accent they 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 they're not familiar with. Um, we will be finishing uh, by seven. Okay, I think it was advertised. This was an hour and a half. It's quite a lot to cover in just an hour. Um, so how do we help them, Victoria, apart from making sure that they're exposed to as many accents as possible? Hmm, how do yeah, we um, help our learners? Yeah, by doing that, we are helping them in general, you know, because this is always relevant. But we need to also um, try to help them before listening and during listening so that they are better prepared to face real life situations. Yeah. Um, Helping them before, before listening, mm -hmm. during yeah. the task, and in general. Um, helping them before, if we're going very exam specific here. And the part two, sentence completion, Victoria? Yeah, we can help them predict. So uh, ask them to read the text uh, in detail. Also look at what comes before and after the gap so that they can predict the part of a speech that they, uh, that they will need. Also, uh, after reading the text, being able to make predictions in terms of content, then listen and, of course, check the, the answers make sense. Yeah. Um, teaching them about distractors, somebody wrote. Excellent. Yes, mm -hmm. you do know that, especially at C1, I mean, even at A2, we use distractors in all of our listings. At C1, they become even more tempting. Um, especially in something like a multiple choice like this. Um, I think multiple choice tends to test the ability to be able to concentrate and pay attention for much longer interviews, longer discussions. Um, and the main focus <clears throat> is showing understanding of the speaker's attitudes and opinions. Um, that's broken down into, Victoria? Yeah, agreement, gist, <coughs> feeling, purpose, function, and also they will need to identify some details. Yeah. Um, helping them beforehand, helpful yeah. language to help them develop these, Victoria, especially in terms of prediction, I think. I think mm -hmm. prediction at this level, because they are, there's a lot for them to read before mm -hmm. the listening. Uh, they've got to spend time reading that and they've got to be able to instantly make predictions based on what they are reading so they are hmm. as 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 ready as possible yeah Ooh, sorry by the time he gets around um to listening the two times through um <clears throat> so based on the yeah on. based on the type of information that they need to be able to understand and uh, make sure that they are ready to identify um, ways to express degrees of certainty, okay? Also, that they know that they are familiar with reporting verbs, that they uh, can identify discourse, discourse markers, and of course, adjectives and adverbs, which can modify the, the information. Exactly. I was just trying to put together a sentence with all of those in it, but I didn't quite get that. As Victoria has just said, <laughs> as Victoria <laughs> just mentioned uh, very well, um, yeah, let's move on. Um, before the listening, <laughs> the multiple matching, Victoria, the um, nice activity. Yeah, part four, um, here we can see that the adjectives are very similar. So it is a nice way to get students to discuss differences in meaning between the adjectives so that they are better prepared uh, for listening afterwards. And a nice way to um, integrate skills again and um, also very useful to get students to remember the vocabulary is to get them to talk about a time in which they felt in such a way. Yep, ways like this, or if we move back on what David was saying before, much more um, clearly than 
my ramblings. The big difference at C1 is precision. And I mean, look, look at this task is horrible. <laughs> Encouraged, hopeful, delighted, relieved, glad, grateful, happy, satisfied. Yeah, these are, I mean, there is a difference in meaning between these, but mm. sometimes it's quite a nuanced difference. And making sure that students are prepared to deal with these, uh, these, these nuances and difference of meaning um, before they go into a listening will help them enormously. Um, whilst they're listening, using the tape script. Somebody said earlier about teaching them about distractors, show them tape scripts. Um, sometimes before a listening, definitely afterwards, show them how the multiple choice options relate to the content in the speaking, show them how distractors are used, how, how they are tempted and how distractors are then disproven should we say mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. other other opportunity other approaches Victoria yeah um listening again you know that in the exam Pardon? they will <laughs> <Sorry. Your word>. <laughs> <laughs> in the exam they will always listen twice um and so make these available also in class and maybe more um uh, more often if if they need to especially at the beginning of the year maybe or the preparation time and also uh, get them um trained to pick out key information and also uh, prepare tasks that help them build their confidence yeah and we know they all hate this one is part four the last part of advanced victoria off the top of your head david should be able to answer but in all of our exams mm -hmm. <clears throat> They are designed so that the tasks get gradually more difficult as the exam mm. progresses, uh, because there's plenty of statistical evidence that shows that if an easier task follows a more difficult task, their performance on the easier task is then affected. Um, so, so yeah, I mean it's 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 a difficult it's a difficult part. Um, helping them generally, as we said before, exposing them to a variety of texts and accents, which especially at C1 becomes even more, well, it, it becomes easier, I think, because this, you can use a lot of authentic text. Somebody said earlier, BBC radio stations, um, BBC Radio 4 and the World Service, you have quite hmm. a nice variety of accents on that. Um, yeah. and there are lots of additional things we're going to look at in a second, don't we, Victoria? Yeah, and yeah. I remember there was uh, World News, one minute, and I, I used to start my lessons with, with that because it is very short, but again, uh, it changes, of course, every day and many times throughout the day. And, and it's you, could great use that, you could use that with a variety of levels, couldn't you? But yeah, 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 you, you just have Quite to easily. adapt the, the activity, but it is yeah. great because there are, there, there are a lot of different accents there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Where did that bit? Where did that? Oh no! Is it in here? Yeah, it is. In it's here. pretty Sorry. speaking. It's in here. Sorry, everyone. I'm getting a little distracted. <laughs> so we're going to finish off the last twenty minutes looking at speaking. Um, mm -hmm. Ways to develop skip speaking skills. What challenges do your students face when they're speaking at C1? In the chat box. What challenges do your students face speaking at this level? Public speaking, mm -hmm. yep. So you wanna, yeah, it's difficult in well, it's difficult in your own language, load in another language. Shyness, appropriacy, fluency. yeah, mm -hmm. fluency. As David said, precision, appropriate use. You can use a lot of vocabulary, but C1, are you using it appropriately? Are you using words that collocate? Um, ideas, confidence, fluency. Yeah, there's a lot. Basically, everything. <laughs> I quite like the everything uh, theme running through this. Uh, range of appropriate vocab, range of cohesive devices, discourse markers, more complex grammatical forms. Victoria? Yeah, familiar topics, also the ability to negotiate, uh, dealing with nerves and trying to, to have... Um, an intonation that makes um, communication effective. Really? Do you find my intonation <laughs> really? difficult sometimes, Victoria? <laughs> sometimes, George, you know that. Really? Sometimes I don't understand what you say. I, I have no idea why. 
Um, oh, oh, Ross has just said, is it bullying? Yes. Yeah. One person said that before. No, we just have fun. We just have a, yeah, she, yeah. she bullies me in Spanish. So, you know, we. we don't know. That's not true. Don't. <laughs> That's what you would say in front of everyone. Um, different ways to help, especially yeah. online, Victoria. Voice yeah. Spice. You discovered this, didn't you? Yeah, I liked it. Uh, I thought it was it is quite useful because um, you just uh, your students can make the recording, save it, and then uh, they send you the link. So they don't need to to send the whole video or the whole recording, which can be a bit too large to send. And then um, if you still want to use videos, you can use Flipgrid and you can suggest a topic and your students can just record themselves uh, replying to the to the task, talking about the, that specific topic. And yeah, you can integrate it in your teaching online and uh, lessons. And also uh, something that I found quite interesting is English Central that you can use to practice intonation. There, uh, there are different videos. Um, you have to learn the words and then record yourself copying the pronunciation and you can get a grade. And then, of course, the BBC pronunciation uh, short videos um, to help um, your students with specific sounds that maybe they find more challenging. Lovely. Um, how can we help getting back to the exam? Um, mm -hmm. The part one is designed to, to to ease students in. They shouldn't really have much of a problem with part one, apart from apart from uh, apart from nerves. I was about to say nerds. I was like, what? <laughs> apart, from, <laughs> apart from nerves, they shouldn't have too much of a problem in part one. Uh, the part two, the long term. Hmm. Um, how can we help set students up? Well, actually, a lot of the a lot of the resources that you just spoke about are really nice ways to practice their part too. Hmm. Um, but yeah. beyond that, Victoria, giving them some language. Yeah, um, they they are likely to to speculate in this part of the of the test uh, because the questions are asking you. We can see them here. What might? Why might? So uh, make sure that your students are ready to use uh, model verbs and different other expressions to to speculate. And also, they may need some more uh, practice with speaking for a longer time, for a longer pe period of time. So try to break down the the task into different stages. Maybe first concentrate on a picture and a question, and then extend lovely um the part three we're going to have a look at the part three in a minute uh, we've only got time to look at one part of the exam today but as i said we'll go into further detail in future webinars uh, but the part three the collaborative task where um the candidates have a question um with five different options that they need to discuss and try and reach a conclusion. A really nice way to prepare for this. Well, one of my favorite resources, even back when I was a teacher and not many people had heard of TED was TED. Mm. Uh, they're beautifully presented, um, nicely accessible. Some of them do have supplementary material. Mm. Um, what was your, what's this exercise, Victoria? Uh, well, this can be adapted to, to different levels, but well, the idea um, here was to get students to brainstorm about the, the topic of teaching and learning uh, with new technologies. And um, we got like two, two photographs for them to compare and contrast and hopefully come up with the ideas in the, in the changes and the evolution of teaching and learning. And then uh, to give them further ideas about the, the topic, uh, they can watch these, this video on TED Talks and um, also become familiar with some of the vocabulary that they will need to do the collaborative task later on. And also um, the idea of uh, giving themselves, the, giving them the opportunity to come up with the ideas to, uh, for the mind map, um, I thought would be um, nice to make them more, um, to make them participate more actively in the in the task. George, yeah, what do helping. You think? Yeah, sorry, no, completely. <laughs> um, involving your students as much as possible in creating mm. the materials, in creating and guiding the lesson. I think 
empowers them and as we said before helps motivate them so um as Vittorio said, having watched the video, they can discuss and come up with the various options, practice a part three together, predict the questions that could then be asked in part four, the closing mm -hmm. part of the exam, compare those questions with other groups, swap them. There's quite a lot you can pull out of one TED video. And as Lucy said on the right hand side, a lot of the TED talks do come with uh, lesson materials attached. Mm -hmm. So please, um, please check it out. It's a great resource. Are we going to watch the video now, Victoria? Or are we going to mm -hmm. do some? No, I think there is wisely. something. There is another task, another yeah, activity. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Daily yeah. challenge: write a controversial statement on the board, like Victoria bullies me. <laughs> um, divide the class into groups, and give each group a minute to plan a response to the to the uh, to the statement. Nominate a speaker. Um, the speakers have one minute to respond, question time to challenge the speaker, and then they reflect on the performance. What is a great, great tool, as with writing, to help them reflecting on performance, Victoria? Um, assessment criteria. Excellent. We'll come on to that in a second. It's probably on page 17 of your handouts, off the top of my head. Uh, mm. Give your students um, the criteria. Uh, for assessing one another. Self-assessment for speaking is, is is harder, I think, but if they're recording themselves, get them to then self-assess. Um, the benefits of using the criteria helps them become aware of their strengths and weaknesses, things they will be examined on in the, in, in the exam, which is not just grammar and vocabulary. Mm -hmm. um, and trying to make it work. Yeah, try make, to have a routine, you know, make exactly. it feel part of the class and normal. Also motivate your students to reflect and, and self-assess. Um, as we said, sometimes we, we may need to use a simplified version of the assessment criteria, maybe not at this level. Um, but we can call them uh, success criteria so that learners know what they need to do um, for success. And then um, use them for self-assessment, for peer assessment, and in general to identify areas for improvement. Lovely. Another resource available on our YouTube. We're going to watch just one part of a speaking test, but show mm -hmm. them the speaking videos, show them the examiner's comments. So watch a video with your students, ask them to listen, probably choose one of them. It's easier if they focus on one of the candidates, think about good things, things that could be improved, and then they share their opinions and give them feedback based on the examiner's comments about how they've done well and what they could have done better. And you can do this, you can do them on their own in groups and in, in pairs and groups of three, depending what online platforms you're using. Um, here is the criteria, which looks like quite a lot, but when you break it down, um, it's quite clear. Um, yeah, and, um, before, oops, sorry, sorry, George. Uh, sometimes we we say that it is a good idea to look at band three, and then take that as a reference to go higher. Exactly what I was about to say. Yeah. Sorry. Three, no, 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 no. It's great that we're on the same page. Uh, band <laughs> three, as we said before, band three is C one. Okay, a three mm. or four. Four is getting up into good C one. Once they get a five, that's C two. Okay. So make sure they understand this criteria. They should be able to understand this, I'd say, at C1. You could maybe, you could simplify some of it um, and, and use it alongside videos to show them what is expected of them. Okay, is it time for the video, Victoria? Mm -hmm, yes. I think so. <laughs> so we're just gonna watch the part three, the collaborative task, okay? So we'd like you to focus on interactive communication, mm -hmm. yeah? You can mm -hmm. focus on a couple if you want. If you're going to share your marks, make sure it's clear which criteria you're talking about. Okay. Um, so we're going to watch this part three, and I cho choose either Raphael on the left or Maud on the right, one of the criteria, and give them a mark. Okay. And we'll see you in a couple of minutes. Now I'd like you to talk about something together for about two minutes. Here are some things that people often have to make decisions about and a question for you to discuss. First, you have some time to look at the task.
now talk to each other about what people might have to consider when making these decisions. Okay, so let's talk about choosing a university first. Mm, I think people have to think about, well, first the students have to think about what they like, yeah. of course, when they, they choose study. a university. Yeah. And students and parents have to think about money because in some countries universities, universities um, is very, are very uh, expensive, like in England here. And I think you have also to um, choose the right university for um, like where you, you can study the subject you really want to and also that the university with the subject is the best university with mm -hmm. from all the universities yes. with the subject subject like the best results in an exam or something yeah. like that and what about starting a family um, again um, there is a financial criteria to consider I think um, and well when you start a family you need to talk maybe about children. Yeah. Mm. You have also to think about if you're um, ready already yes. to build a family and if you have the, enough money and... And where to settle uh, yeah. and you need to think about the jobs maybe yes. because I think that now um, most of the parents, I mean the two parents are working so they need to, yeah. to take that in consideration. Hello. All of these are available on YouTube, um, everyone. And yep, Silvana has said it. Gil's slightly better. We need to make clear, and it's very easy when you see these videos to compare the students, but our examiners only assess each candidate alongside the criteria. So there's no comparison between the candidates that goes on within an exam. And it's very difficult not to as teachers. Um, but if we have a quick look at interactive communication, uh, Raphael responds appropriately, links his ideas to Maud's. Um, he, there are several times where he just nods but doesn't take the initiative, he doesn't take the opportunity, opportunity to contribute, letting her develop the discussion more when they're talking about jobs and about language. He's a little shyer than she is. And you have to remember that all these poor candidates, they're being filmed. It's not a real, it's not the exam that counts for them, but they are being filmed, so they do very well. Uh, he contributes more to the discussion in the decision part of the task than at the beginning. Um, and he thinks there's something to add when they both seem to have said everything they could. Um, and Maud, Victoria? Um, and Maud contributes with ideas and organizes them clearly with good linking. Um, and well, uh, I think that's pretty much it for this course management. But in general, we can see that she leads the conversation more. I don't know if you agree, George. Yeah, she does. She, but I hear is again a bit quiet. She mm. does lead a little bit more. Um, she could have contributed a bit more to the interaction part and the decision part mm. to keep this going for the whole minute. Um, but yeah, there are lots of these videos with examiners' comments. And uh, not all of them give marks, but that encourages you and your students to look at how the criteria is quoted in the comments. That's the important thing. I think the important thing is getting used to using the criteria and quoting the criteria um, to then decide on what mark is going to be given. Mm -hmm. um, that's all we have time for today. We've got a few more minutes with some uh, resources to give you all. I've given everyone access, I'll do it one more time, to the useful links document, which has lots of stuff on it, and to the certificate. The certificate is an editable PDF. It doesn't have your name on it. But if you open it with any PDF program, you should be able to type your name in, okay? So, Victoria. Yep. Uh, on our website, we have a section called Supporting Every Teacher, and you can find a wide range of 
of material from free teaching resources to exam preparation material, also our blog supporting every teacher. And you can also um, have a look at the webinars that are planned. Um, for the free teaching resources, you can see that there are some um, lesson plans that will help you to teach online so they are adapted to the to the new situation that yeah. we are living the, these um, have all been all been put together in the last few weeks uh, so there's quite a lot for a2 and b1 the b2 i think there's quite a few now there will be more c1 i'm not sure if any are available yet but they're very much en route mm -hmm. and as victoria said they've all been designed with the current situation in mind um, they will work outside of the online situation but at the moment i assume that's what um we are all focusing on Sorry, Victoria, for interrupting. No, no, no. <laughs> Thank you for adding new ideas. And also, um, please um, have a look at the support pack for teachers. Um, again, lots of resources there. I think it's uh, you have everything there in just one document, so you don't need to be um, going through our website. Everything is there for you to, to check, um, teaching material, lesson plans, um, exam material, and also some ideas uh, for teaching mixed ability classes, for example. Lovely. Um, and here are various links. As I said, they're all on that useful links document. Um, so check all of that out. Use, write, and improve. It's amazing. Read and improve, speak and improve are still in development. Mm -hmm. um we don't want to dash all of your students hopes because the speak and improve gives them something a bit lower than they probably are um that can happen sometimes so uh, write and improve please use um liberally the others are there as a resource mm -hmm. uh, but they're still in development so please remember that um yeah, thank you all very much. Any questions just for the last minute or so? Any questions from anyone? Yes, Rosa, that is the link. You have to create an account, but if you have one on Write and Improve, it's the same um, It's the same login that you use for that. And yes, Christina, for C1, you have to study a lot. Yeah, unfortunately, that is... Yeah. <laughs> Unavoidable. <laughs> That's the case, yeah. And the certificate you should be able to download at the bottom right hand side of your screen in the files section. Stop sharing, share certificate. If you can't do that, um, email the uh, email address available on the website. Well, thank you all very much. We're glad it was useful. Um, keep an eye on on the website where you signed up for this. New mm -hmm. webinars are going up there all the time. Um, what day is it, Victoria? Tuesday. Today? Yeah, we'll probably do probably do B two B two next time. It's Monday today, right, you? Is it? Oh God, it's Monday. Oh, I'm ahead of myself already. Uh, we'll probably do the B two next next week, um, and we'll start on those C one C two combined webinars to go into more detail. Okay. Um, we had a question, C1 validity. Hmm. What exactly did you mean by that? If you have time in the chat box. <laughs> We're thinking about putting together a series, maybe for a couple of weeks time on, on assessment. Um, so it'll probably be one sort of overview of the fundamentals of assessment and applying those to your lessons and how we can assess well um uh and and reliably online and then we'll probably do one for each skill um so we can go into we can go into um into more detail more on detail. things like validity and reliability in that session all right thank you all very much lovely to see you all apologies for um for last week and thank you for coming back um <clears throat> the Video should be on YouTube later this week, I imagine. Okay. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> unfortunately, unfortunately, Victoria is already very happily married. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if it was my place to answer that, Victoria, but yes. Yes, yours. No um, all right. Thank you all very much. <laughs> thank you very much. Have a good week. Stay safe. <laughs> bye bye. bye, -bye. <laughs>